welcome to Labor Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. On this week edition of the program, we'll be focusing on workers in the oil and gas sector, the several challenges they are faced with, and the progress that the union has been able to make towards ensuring that they have decent work. Workers' rights and socio-economic justice is the thrust of this year's International Day of Workers in Nigeria. Workers say their welfare is central to the achievements of socio-economic justice as one of the key indices for national and global sustainability. For organized labor, it is time for government to take deliberate actions to expand and strengthen the nation's social security network. Top on their demands, is upward review of workers' salary. Organized labor also seeks the review of retirement age from 60 to 65 years, as well as the signing into law of the National Research and Innovation Council Bill. Nigerians and Nigerian workers need evidence of the commitment of the Nigerian leaders to ensuring their safety, their security, their progress, and eventually their liberty. It is only the proof of this that can reconnect the masses and workers with the government. We call on federal governments to consider the incorporation of transition fuel, such as CNG, as an addition to currently available energy in Nigeria. The use of compressed natural gas, which is a lot cheaper, can also be long-term alternative to petrol. For the outgoing president, the last eight years of his administration have been eventful as it placed priority on the welfare of the workers. I encourage the incoming administration to continue to respect workers' rights imbued with social economic development and driven by the four pillars of decent work agenda. In Ibadan, Yoyo State Capital, workers including civil servants, teachers, health workers, artisans and traders all converged on the main bowl of the Lake Salami Stadium to commemorate this year's Workers' Day celebration. <laughs> Governor Sheyi Makinde promised to continue to ensure consistency in the payment of workers' salaries, asking them to support his administration by shunning all forms of misconduct. We must make sure that we are accountable and responsible for properties and assets that have been entrusted into our care, be it in public or private sector. In Ogun State, Governor Dakwa Biodun joined workers to celebrate the day at the Moshud Abiola Stadium in the state capital, Abiokuta. He promised to continue to ensure a purposeful leadership and enhance welfare packages for workers for improved service delivery. Consequently, in the second phase of administration, we will ensure the completion of all ongoing infrastructure projects, encompassing transport, transportation infrastructure, be it roads, be it airports, education infrastructure, be it the creation of public schools, health infrastructure. In Ondo State, this year's celebration was not devoid of the usual match past and fun fair as the workforce presented the governor an award for his special attention to their welfare. The governor was represented by a special advisor on labor matters, Dari Aragbaye. So that whatever is due to workers is given to them without delay. He did not stop at that. He has also been stressing the need to accommodate pensioners. Uh, you will see for yourself what he had done for pensioners in our state since he assumed office. For the second time running now, he's approving consequential adjustment in their pensions. In Ekiti State, workers gathered at the Ekiti Parakwa Pavilion, where the state governor, Biodun Oyebanji, reiterated his commitment to ensure no worker in the state is denied their rights. Our administration will continue to make determined effort to improve workers' condition of service within available resources. As you are aware, arrears of salaries of local government workers 
and they are still still having contraband. The celebration is a reminder of the important role that workers play in the development of the nation and a call to action to ensure their contributions to national development are valued and recognized. The leadership of Nigerian Labour Congress NLC and Trade Union Congress TUC have appealed to the Yobe state government to consider the payment of gratuity to retired workers across the state. The appeal was read to journalists by the chairman state NLC of the Yobe state at Damaturu, where all workers converged to commemorate the 2023 Workers' Day. The devil is very much aware of the government efforts in, crea uh, in creating conducive environment for civil servants ranging from office renovation and furniture supply. Nevertheless, uh, notwithstanding, we want you to consider the payment of 100 million monthly for gratuity. Yeah, the shares areas are areas of pension and gratuity. Really, the Yobe State workers who have retired have not yet been paid their gratuity and pensions. These are very grave areas and we are appealing strongly to the Yobe State government as a matter of uh, policy to install more than 100 million by every month so that workers' gratuity and pension could be paid. You know, people have worked for 35 years after retiring, no money, nothing. Active and vibrant health workers are retiring. Like what is like on today, instead of 35 years, uh, uh, 35 years in service, we want the state government to extend the number of years to be 40 years, like our other colleagues in Barno State, Adamawa State, uh, Kaduna State, and uh, recently last week, Kano State. On the profile interview segment this week, I'll be speaking with the national president of the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association, Comrade Festus Osifo. He brings us up to speed on what he and his team has been able to achieve in the last three years and what members in the association should be expecting from his administration if he is re-elected into office. All right, it's good to have you on the program. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. It's like I've been seeing more of you recently, yeah, of course. <laughs> but of course there's been a lot of activities um, in your sector. Yeah, certainly. So very quickly, let's move on to some of the achievements that you've been able to um, carry on or carry mm. out in your industry, especially for Pengatan and its members. It's been three years. Can you bring us up to speed on what you would say you've done for your members? Ah. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite enormous. Uh, it's quite long, uh, but I'll just uh, try to compress it. Um, so I'll just talk briefly on um, what we've been able to do in terms of uh, our staff. Mm -hmm. Because the reason I always like starting from staff is that these are the people that you are expecting to champion some of the courses for your members. So you cannot have people uh, championing courses for your members, going around to sign wonderful CBAs for your members, and at the end of the day, they are not properly compensated. Mm -hmm. So that is actually why I, I, I took it upon myself and I uh, discussed with the entire executives that we must look after the plight of the members. So what were the few things that we've been able to do for them when we came on board? The first thing was that we discovered that some of them were not promoted for years. Some of the staff of the secretariat for almost 10 years, they weren't promoted. And we said, no, that this must not be allowed to continue. So we promoted them. We regularized their promotion. And today they are quite happy. So the issues of promotions are not there anyway. You cannot see anybody in Pengasan who has spent maybe three, four years in a grade that is still in that particular grade. So we try to, we try to regularize that. Then also, um, when we came on board, we discovered that uh, the issue of healthcare. There was no proper healthcare plan for the member, for the staff of the secretariat. We just pay them some money at the end of the month. Uh, we sum it up at the end of the year. We give it to them. Mm -hmm. But we felt that no, that's not a proper healthcare plan. So what did we do? We the money that they were paying them as at that time. We 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 allowed them. I mean, we converted it to another item. Mm -hmm. But we brought HMO for them. That today themselves. Uh, their wives, their spouses, and their children. They could assess uh, health care. So we did that for them. Then also, we looked at the condition of work as well. 
and we we define some conditions of work for them. So we we then in terms of their CBA negotiations in the last in the last three years. We have given them some good percentage increment in addition to what they will get at the beginning of the year, which is a normal inflation adjustment of 5%. Mm -hmm. We signed a new CBA for them, and I think they are quite happy. In fact, in 2021, they sent us a commendation letter commending us that it has not been so good. And I believe uh, that that is the way to go. Uh, because if we are telling management, if we are pushing in the industry that improve the plight of our members, so we should be able to lead by example by giving the staff that we have employed, by giving them good condition of service. Then uh, the the last I would say in this in this category is uh, of this category of, of, of employees, actually the contract staffing. When we came on board, about 10, 12 of them, they were contract staff. I was alarmed. I said, no, in Pengasa, this cannot exist. Because if we are telling management of other company not to casualize, we should lead by example. So we converted everybody that were heated to contract staff to uh, in quote, permanent staff, and they are quite happy. Their families are quite happy, and uh, that is the way to go. Then, in terms of our members, in fact, uh, you know we have over 140 branches in Pengasa. In the public sector, you know after the PI was passed, there was apprehension of what is going to happen to the, the job of our members and what is also going to happen to the condition of service. And that was one of the things we did, Pengasan and Nupen, we championed that no, that the condition of service of our members must be protected and their jobs must also be protected. And thank God today, nobody has lost his or her jobs. So part of what we did was that we had some networking across the industry where we tried to advocate formally and informally on how the remuneration of our members in these establishments will be enhanced. And largely, I could say NNPC, NMDPRO, NUPRO, PTDF, they have done something extremely good for our members. Uh, in NNRO, it, it is much more better than how we met it. In PTI, it's much more better than how we met it. In Atomic Energy, they just started earning their hazard allowance recently. It was something they did they, that agitated them for years. Then, uh, we are also pushing uh, in energy commission. Mm -hmm. Then if you now take it more sensitively to the the private sector, you know, when we came on board, there were popular of issues. Popular of issues, issues in Baker Hills, issues in Techon, issues in Sterling, mm -hmm. issues I could go on and on and on. So part of what we did was that we came and said, no, it is no longer business as usual that the issue of um, Baker Hills, you cannot sack an existing, a sitting branch chairman. You, it's just like in a ship. You want to throw the captain into the sea, then the entire crew will become directionless. That you cannot do that. So part of what we did was that the people that were that were placed on redundancy illegally because they did not follow the procedure. Uh, from Ministry of Labor, we had the backing from the director of the Ministry of Labor, though uh, the minister had his own different course because he wanted the branch chairman to go. But we insisted that no, he will not go. And thank God we were able to resolve that. The issue of punishment, that they weren't paid their severance benefit two years before we came on board. We are also able to put that to an end. The issues that are bordering on uh, examinable contracts, they were laying them off on a daily basis three months before we came on board. They wanted to extinguish them uh, two months after our reign, but we said no. We put a stop to it. And from that time till now, there was a strong collaboration between the branch, between the examinable in-house branch, and the national. We all came together and we resisted them and that issue is a thing of the past. Similarly, in Chevron, we had about 600 workers who they had planned to let go. Mm -hmm. In fact, they had made up their mind, the entire stakeholders in the oil and gas industry said they must go. But we said no, that they will not go. That for them to go, you need to define, um, let it be voluntary. That you could even have more than 600. But they said no, these are the targeted people that they must go. Meanwhile, in several locations, they were short staff. They call people from time off to come and work. They bring people that are on vacation to come and work. Mm -hmm. So you already short staff, you want to let go 600, but we had the intel that mm -hmm. they were trying to, to hire some casual staff in order to reduce costs. We said, no, mm -hmm. this must not happen. So we stood our ground and, and today, no single individual was let go. In Shell, 
almost the same thing. They wanted to do compulsory redundancy that about 200 people plus, uh, 200 plus members that they have to go. We resisted them and those men, uh, and they now moved to voluntary. So those people that were willing to go now voluntarily opted to leave. In Techon, we had issues that they were paying our members 30% reduction in salary. Mm -hmm. We said no, and they did it unilaterally without discussing with the union. We said no, that must be reversed. That has since been reversed. Then uh, we could go to um, all other companies. Moving on, unionization is um, a big deal in trade unionism, and we are very much aware that we have so many companies that do not want their workers to belong or to associate um, with the union. Can you bring us up to speed what the response has been in your industry? Uh, yes, um, actually you have such. Um, you have some company management who doesn't really want the workers to be unionized. But uh, since we came on board, I, I, I could say that we've brought in over 25 new, new companies. We have brought them into the fold. Um, companies like Aeroton, companies like Health Odin's, uh, company like SN, SMBO from the Lagos end and all whatnot. So we have actually unionized them. And I think they are also seeing the benefits uh, because SMBO, for example, has a lot of companies within that mix. And in Shell, before now, uh, they don't even have collective bargaining agreement. Uh, but immediately we came in, we said, no, that has to be done. They have signed their first um, collective bargaining agreement now. So that is value of being a me the value you derive from being a member of a trade union. Then Aeroton, for example, the government, um, uh, NMPC, yeah. created a company called NMPC 18 Limited to run the affairs of Aeroton. So currently, we are trying to discuss with them to find out the best ways with which they will engage them or they severe them. So it's because they are members of Pengasan that we are having such conversation. If they weren't in Pengasan, it would have been difficult for us to engage the stakeholders. Before now, a lot doesn't really want to come in because you have one or two skirmishes. But when they see what those that are within the ranks and within the folds are enjoying, mm. so most of them are willingly contacting us that they want to be part of uh, the association. Talking about your style of leadership, how would you describe it vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, industrial relations and collective bargaining agreements? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I think in terms of industrial relations, uh, I don't like scoring myself actually, but I could say that the members are quite happy uh, because um, this is the, lead, the part of leadership we, myself and my team brought to bear was that we don't allow anything that will agitate or remove the job of our members or anything that will reduce their pay. We never allow that. Instead, we try to protect the jobs and we also do everything possible to enhance their pay. So in terms of IRO, I think largely, I think it's been, it's been good in the last three years. I could go through one company to another and give you this scorecard uh, because um, uh, when we approach this management and when we approach government, we go there with sincerity of purpose. The, the, it is about the interest of our members. What are those things we will do to improve the living condition or the working condition of our members? That has been our cardinal objective in the last three years. And I could say, so far, so good. In fact, when we came in, one of the issues that was also agitating was the issue of IPPIS. If you remember, I was in TVC and we were all shouting that government must take into cognizance the peculiarities of the or of some of the allowances being earned in oil and gas. So initially, they were playing games, but when we mounted the right, uh, the right saddle, uh, they, they listened and we were able to also uh, resolve that. Then we could go even Nezomobol. Recently, there have been an, there, there was an issue in Nezomobol that led to shutdown for uh, almost about 10 days plus. Uh, but thank God, we were able to resolve the issues in favor of our members. Because for us, when we are having those IRO discussions, all we look out for is what will be done to the best interest of our members. Then we've had issues, you know, the issues that we are bordering on ADAX contracts. So for several years, for, from 2015, there was no CBA. But we were able to also situate that and we gave them a CBA. That now assisted us. When um, NMPC now took over the assets, the asset of OML 13, 
one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, six, and one, three, seven. When they took those assets over, because we already had an existing CBA, mm -hmm. negotiation was a bit easier for us to resolve the issues. And they paid them their severance, and almost all of them that are willing to work, they are still there today working. They're the same thing as well. We also did that for mobile, uh, for others in house, the other staff mm -hmm. uh, members. We were also able to do. Um, have a conversation with the stakeholders and at the end of the day we gave uh, the condition of exit was quite exciting that they were all happy but most of them the company now brought them back uh, so they've paid them off but majority of them okay. are back and they are working today and they are quite happy and excited so for us we think that the last three years uh, the initial fears that we had that oh covid because, because people were working from home, they were locked down here and there. Will they go back to work? Or will this company let them go? Ah, I could confirm that by the special grace of God and by the dint of hard work, that the worst was actually averted, that although the company's tried, as was the case in Chevron, as was in the case of um, Shell and the likes, but we were able to resist them that today none of our members were forced out. Whenever we are going to meet the management of any company, we go with the branch chairman or the branch executive mm -hmm. so that uh, the branch will be carried along. And the branch, branches will also give some level of autonomy to operate. We gave them some level of autonomy for them to operate and we, are able, we, are, we, are, we have been able to return dignity and respect mm -hmm. to the branches because we do tell them that they are the full soldiers, mm -hmm. that we don't exist. We cannot exist without them. Mm. Very quickly, um, the issue of casualization and outsourcing of workers is a general issue or challenge that workers are faced with in Nigeria. Basically, or virtually all sector or industry is affected by this. As an experienced labor leader, um, what do you think would be your advice or how do you think government and relevant stakeholders can come in to ensure that it is being reduced or eradicated to the barest minimum. Yes. So now, the, the, the issue of, um, you know, some call it outsourcing, some call it, uh, the problem that is actually there is the condition of work surrounding these. At the time, in the company where I work, Total EMP, or Total Energies EMP today, we actually went to Netherlands for a training. So as we were in Netherlands, I met a particular lady. And the lady has a contract staff in Netherlands for 15 years. So I asked her, ah, lady, why you have been a contract staff? On? He said, she said yes, that she wants to remain as a contract staff. I asked her why. She said no, that she doesn't want the company to detect for her the hospital she will go. She doesn't want the company to detect. She wants her freedom. That day she's tired. She take her bag and she leave. But... The salary she earns is much more than the salary a regular staff earns. Uh, so it's about the condition of service. It's about the remuneration structure. Uh, we practice the exact opposite here in Nigeria today. Mm. A regular staff will earn much more than a contract staff. And you will in turn also provide the regular staff with hospitals, you provide the regular staff with a lot of other things. But these contract staff, you pay them peanuts and you end up not providing them with the basic things that they could live decent life with or work with. So, so your position now is that government and relevant agencies actually have to spell out what contract staffing should be all Exactly. About. So, so there must be standardization. Mm. Don't leave it to the whims and caprices of these employees. In some other clients, that is what is being done. The problem here in Nigeria that trade unions always have is that our institutions are very, very weak. Mm. In Angola, for example, they have some laws. It's such a way that if you work there for three years, they send you away. They have some laws around casualization and they, they enforce it and implement. But the trade unionists here, we do the job of the immigration. A trade unionist here, we do the job of a police. A trade unionist here will do the job of um, the various ministries. That is not supposed to be. But today, we have some jobs that are in the organ organogram of the organization being outsourced. And that is against the letter and spirit of the outsourcing policy. So there must be a complete framework. Mm -hmm. When there is the framework, the union will certainly put for its implementation. But today, we don't have 
early. Finally, you're expecting a re-election mm -hmm. into office. What should your members be expecting from you? Uh, yes, uh, like as we have, uh, uh, like I said uh, a while ago, that uh, Pengasa member did not vote for a cent or they did not vote for an angel to be their president, uh, but they voted for uh, someone that uh, will work for them 24 hours of the day. Like has been said, that angels are in heaven and saints are, are also in heaven. Uh, but we have tried to work for them. We have tried to work the talk. We have tried to deliver value for an average Pengasa member in terms of, I mean, if most of our members today look their pay slip, they will see um, an, uh, an improvement. Uh, when they check their CBA, what was it in the past, what is it today, they will see some level of improvement. And also, uh, there are still some uh, that we are still a bit struggling with, but that's actually the minority. But in union, we say injury to one is injury to all. So until all the lives of Pengasa members are better off for it, we will not rest. So uh, literally, we have worked for them. We have delivered service, very qualitative service. We have also delivered value. And I don't think that as of today, uh, a well-meaning Pengasa member regrets for giving us their mandate three years ago. And we believe that God being on our side and uh, the delegates also standing by us, we believe next week, we believe by the special grace of God, we'll be given the mantle to continue for another three years. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember that labor creates wealth.